Welcome to Western Sydney University. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that today's panel discussion is being held on the country of the Darak people of the Darak Nation, and we would like to acknowledge their ancestors, who have been traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. We would also like to acknowledge and pay our respect to the Darak elders, past and present. Today's panel discussion is on the topic of digital media in a post-truth era, and we have two specialists here in slightly different topics who are going to be talking about issues relevant to this theme. The first is Professor Hart Cohen. Dr Hart Cohen is Professor in Media Arts in the School of Humanities and Communication Arts and is a member in the Institute for Culture and Society and the Digital Humanities Research Group here at Western Sydney University. Dr Cohen has led three Australian Research Council projects relating to the Stralo Collection held at the Stralo Research Centre in Alice Springs and he's currently working on digital archives, data diversity, and discoverability. The Stralo Connection as knowledge resource for remote indigenous communities. Hart Cohen is the co-author of Screen Media Arts, an introduction to concepts and practices for Oxford University Press, 2009. And he's the editor of Global Media Journal, Australian edition, 2007 through to the present. So I'm going to turn it over to Hart now, who'll talk to us a little bit about his interest in this topic. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, I think I might just read a statement, um, opening statement relating to um, digital media in the post-truth era. And I think if one talks about post-truth, you have to think Donald Trump, I think, pretty much at the same time. So I'll just talk a bit about the election of Donald Trump. Um, election of Donald Trump has released a wave of concern about media values, but the key question of credible or fake being assigned to both mainstream news outlets and the tweets unleashed by the president himself. It seems to me that Trump resists being truthful and then lies about his untruthfulness. His penchant for disputing facts with so-called alternative facts and labeling any stories that might counter his view of the world as fake has certainly opened up a new ethical space, but it is frighteningly an amoral in nature, or maybe we should say post-moral. One cannot help but feeling closer to fiction than reality. Could we imagine a reality television host and celebrity being elected president of the United States on a ticket of overt, overt xenophobia? Well, perhaps yes, as a Hollywood script or a Netflix series or something conjured up uh, by the successors to the makers of the West Wing. Um, but digital media in its social and longer news formats have played a significant role in the dissemination of content that seems to emulate the fake and fraudulent forms of information that have been recently circulated in high profile contexts. So it seems to me the issue divides those who wish to maintain accountability and a return to so-called truth values in media against those who see the chaos president as a change agent and therefore with a greater chance to move an arrested country out of its current doldrums. It would seem that the media, digital and or social, will play a key role in arbitrating this particular divide. Um, so uh, I think with that, um, I might just leave it there and then take up any questions we well, might deal with. I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. point you're making there in that you're, you're almost describing Trump's presidency as a media event, right? That it's, it's really a produced situation. It, but I was wondering, it's actually almost a familiar feeling that we've had this sort of thing historically with royal families, right? That they're a spectacle for people, that that's, that's actually part of their role. Do you think maybe this is more of a return to that sort of thing? I, I'm not sure if it's a return to the royal family spectacles because um, it's a, a, a little bit of an aberration with Trump. It occurs to me that in a way, it's hard not to look at Trump. So in that sense, you're right. The spectacle quality of Trump is amazing, really. I, I think uh, if you did a rough count of the number of times he's been mentioned in, in the media, it would be um, certainly you know, way, way beyond anyone else's name being mentioned in the media. So there is this element that the, there is a sense of spectacle about it. We can't not but look at Trump, listen to Trump, mm -hmm. et cetera. The issue for me, though, is that there's a huge kind of negativity that surrounds his presence. And if even we go back to a moment where in, uh, I think, a week in, I think it would have been the last week of March or close to that, where successively on, on each day, it seemed like his whole administration was just unraveling before our eyes. And if you looked at the public media in that week, they, could, they were beside themselves. They couldn't believe 
how they were going to deal with all this so-called uh, news or events surrounding the most important position possibly in the political sense in the world, let alone in the United States. So you're right, the spectacular quality of it is there. And uh, in all its kind of almost um, embarrassing negativity, we can't help but want to look at it and watch it carefully. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound as though I'm defending Trump's presidency in any, any sense, but it does strike me when you say, you know, you looked at one point there was something happening every day and, and just new things coming out all the time. I wonder how much of that sense that this is really new and different it comes from the fact that we're so surrounded by media right now and you can't help but anywhere you go online, people are commenting constantly on, on current events. There's Twitter, there's social media of other types, there's, there's the news 24 hour cycles. That's, that's something we didn't have a couple of decades ago and I wonder if maybe previous presidencies or governments around the world that may have been just as much of a spectacle and just as disastrous didn't just didn't get that airtime. What do you think? Um, well, perhaps. I mean, of course, uh, I think we are in a different, completely different media space, perhaps than f even five or ten years ago. Um, the um, the kind of whole um, explosion, I suppose, of of internet-based media, of social media, all the rest of it does, as you say, kind of enhance that sense of constant commentary and constant engagement with that material. But I guess my, my um, reference back to the royals, or your reference mm -hmm. to the royals, reminded me of the death of Princess Diana yeah. in, in a period of four or five days. I mean, there was you know, a constant barrage, and perhaps there, maybe we had one of the first instances of what I think had been called global mourning, where uh, you know, a whole world was transfixed mm -hmm. by this uh, particular event. And within that, again, the the very negative uh, approach taken by the royal family, which almost led to the destruction of the monarchy, again fed by the British press and the world press around the kind of inactivity or the inability of the royal family to respond, you know, appropriately to to Diana's death. So there are, you know, kind of mm -hmm. parallels even going back you know, some 20 years ago around that particular huge media event, and we have other examples of that, um, you know, prior to the current kind of um, chatter around, around uh, Trump. But if you're asking, is there anything unprecedented mm -hmm. about this r relationship between Trump and the media? Well, it, it is unprecedented in, in many aspects. I mean, we don't n normally have as the President of the United States a serial liar. Um, normally, we don't have a President of the United States imbricated with business deals all over the world, including family members that are part of his administration that themselves are imbricated in business deals around the world and in America. So those are, are two very important, unprecedented elements that, if they're not dealt with in some fashion soon, I think we'll be in a situation where there'll be people looking for mm, impeachment proceedings pretty quickly. Yeah, right. That's the hope, at least, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was intrigued with your reference to the West Wing. And the West Wing obviously represented an idealized version of politics and the presidency. And uh, that was obviously in a period where there was kind of that need for a shift towards that kind of presidential um, environment. And then that was replaced by shows like uh, House of Cards. Well, which, yeah, which deal uh, in, in deception and image rather than character and how, you know, the, the things that we choose to entertain ourselves about politics have nothing to do with the public good, they're to do with people standing on other people to elevate themselves, you know, up a ladder uh, as opposed to actually, you know, doing something that's important to the communities and society. So, in many ways, Trump may appear unprecedented, but potentially the... Uh, entertainment and the environments that we that we operate in paved the way for that kind of thing to take place. I, I think you're right to the extent that I think Don Watson nailed it in the monthly article uh, in March where he ascribes Trump to a whole tradition of American hucksterism mm -hmm. and and many literary and filmic uh, antecedents you know before him and and describes Trump as actually you know the heart of America in a way the mm -hmm. you know yeah. this is someone who's come out of you know, you know a, a very um, prominent and mainstream American way of being. Uh, so in that way, you know, you could say, well, it's, it's not a question of being precedented or unprecedented. It's more a question of how one engages with something that seems so outrageous 
at one level, on another level, seems actually in the, in the mainstream of certain parts of American culture? I think the, the answer is probably somewhere in between. I mean, we, you talk, you led with the West Wing kind of reference, but the, I think one of the very successful succeeding uh, programs that that same person wrote, is it Aaron? Aaron Sulkin. Sulkin. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, he wrote the newsroom yeah, as well. Yeah, newsroom was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So you Same have sort of message, right? Yeah. Well, there yeah. is, yeah, kind of an interesting, and, and I think in watching the newsroom, very prescient about mm. the sort of politics that were mm. going to emerge in America, you know, subsequently. So is it the case that maybe all these sort of television writers now have a kind of sense as to the uh, way in which American politics is, well, is moving? Is considered to be part mm. of the enemy these days. <laughs> It's actually interesting you bring up the um, the newsroom because I, I feel like that show was maybe in some ways unrealistically ideological about about what the media could be, right? And and you talk about a, a previous era of truth values in media. I mean, I, I want to pick up on that. Mm. Do you really think that there was any, any such thing as mm. truth values at the heart of the media? Well, I think the way I, I, I would answer that is simply that there there was once a debate about it, and now that debate has been in a way kind of lost or, um, you know, you can't think about debating truth values in the context of a Trump tweet that sends everyone, you know, running to, to their desks to try to work out first whether there's any accuracy to it, and quite often there isn't, uh, and then, you know, how to then reconstruct that in a news flash that makes any sense at all to, you know, to your audience. And I, I think it's interesting to look at some of the more, what I consider to be the more credible news uh, sources around uh, on public television, one of them being uh, PBS or the public broadcasting system, you know, they, they immediately look for some kind of evidence-based uh, argument to counter a, say, uh, Trump tweet like Obama, you know, um, has wiretapped my uh, Trump Tower. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, they only can come up with, in a sense, uh, you know, the, the view that this is inaccurate. There's no accuracy to that, and we use the FBI or whatever we use to kind of make that argument. So whereas one time there might have been a way that you could construct an argument about whether the media is truthful or not, mm -hmm. now I think the sense is that no, we can't even go there. We have to at least come back to the ground of evidence and try to as ascertain whether we can bring evi evidence to the fore and make that work in the, in, in the, in the service of what we're doing, which is creating some form of accuracy in the news. Mm. I wonder, though, if that's what the average viewer actually wants, though. When, when you look at, say, the debates between Clinton and Trump, what, what we saw time and again was Clinton came out there with evidence and, and threw figures on the table and made really strong intellectual arguments for things, and Trump appealed to people's emotions, and mm. obviously that was, in the end, what was very popular. So I'm not sure that media coming at us with evidence is really going to change anything? Yeah, um, I think, um, well, there's w a lot of ways to analyze the, the contest between Clinton and Trump. Uh, I, I knew a few people who were definitely not Trump supporters, but were greater uh, uh, kind of anti-Clinton people <laughs> than, you know, they saw it was the lesser of two evils, mm. in effect, to have Trump, but not really the lesser of two evils, but I guess this, this, the sense that if you elected, if Trump was elected, what would happen and I think it's, it's been borne out, is that you would have at least some sense of moral clarity. I mean, you couldn't help but retreat into a view that what we were dealing with was, you know, a disaster. And so this uptake, for example, of um, liberal left-wing uh, long-form journalism, you know, the increase in the New York Times subscriptions or the interest uh, in reading the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, you know, all this media which had been going downhill, Trump kind of saved. So, so it's a, a deep irony that that this this um, you know kind of person that represents who knows what part of the alt right, part of his own business interests, you know, as as president has actually galvanized a huge part of the American electorate, uh, you know, to try to do something about it. So the recent you know um, polls in in Georgia, for example, um, you know, there's going to be a runoff now in a highly uh, oriented Republican district um, by a whisker, uh, the Democrat candidate, you know, has now forced a runoff. So that says something about what the election of Trump has done, which it's galvanized a, a kind of group 
of um, potential electorate, uh, a potential electorate to, to now actually go into action, uh, where before it might have been either just happy to let uh, Clinton lose um, or to, um, in effect, not, not vote at all, which mm -hmm. many people didn't do. Do you know the percentage of American voters? And no, no, no. Um, but, but I was a, a um, it's something we were discussing yesterday, how uh, Trump might actually unite people, but not in the way that he intended. <laughs> uh, and we're also uh, discussing the term alt-right, mm. uh, how uh, there, there are new terms that come about that kind of neuter uh, the, the political content of what they're suggesting. Like, you know, right wing has a, has a history to it mm. that, you know, is, is really troublesome and problematic, and we know what it suggests when we hear it. But alt-right, you know, suggests an alternative. It suggests something that is, you know, not as harm, harmful, and uh, but so that the, you know, the words we're using to talk about these things, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, rob us of the uh, critical content or the critical capacity that we need to properly engage with this, uh, the, properly engage with these kinds of issues. Well, I think that's that's really true, and I think too that. Terms like the alt-right mm -hmm. and so on, th this whole new swing in the way we talk about things seems to be really closely connected to social media, right? It's how the alt-right has described themselves mm. on the internet. And without that platform, we may not have had this change in our vocabulary. So I, w I wanted to come back to that actually and ask you maybe Hard or, or Jason if, you're, if you have some ideas about that. Um, what, how you see the differing roles of traditional media and digital media, maybe even social media in this new context? Well, I was just going to mention Twitter um, because I think Twitter has really come to the fore, given Trump's uh, quite, you know, good ability in using Twitter to to a great effectiveness. And I just wanted to comment that the the sense of of Twitter for me, as I guess it's referred to as a kind of um, a form of social media, um, but it, it seems to hark back to uh, a much earlier form of exchange, which I would call gossip, except it's electronic gossip, and being effective or gossipacious, as I think might be the word. Is that a word? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think one of my professors very long time ago used it, I think it in the context word. of, um, mm -hmm. of um, McLuhan's approach to communications. But um, I think that the form here is that you have, you have a, a kind of tweet that, it, that comes out. There's, you know, from, from Trump, a huge number of followers, and it's retweeted. Um, and so it becomes more like uh, gossip more like an oral form of communication than than a literate one and in that way uh, the distributive power of his tweets I think make more impact than you know the content themselves mm -hmm. um, so uh, everyone kind of can puzzle themselves over the content but the fact that there are so many people engaged by it to me kind of harks to the idea of oral um, oral communication and how that worked almost in that way in which McLuhan described, uh, you know, the, the forms of, um, of uh, the global village and all that. Mm -hmm. And he, he made a big deal out of the idea that the move from typographic man or woman to, um, to an, a kind of orality where the, um, the eye is superseded by the ear was part of, you know, his contribution to trying to understand how media was changing in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, in a way, Twitter has picked up on that idea mm -hmm. and, and uh, I think moves us to think more about the power of orality in this situation and the, 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 the kind of miniature stories that can be told um, through Twitter that, that Trump has exploited so effectively. Yeah, you're right. Did you have anything to add to that, Josie? Uh, I think that's a very grand explanation, to say the least. Um, I, I, I probably would add that um, when the internet first came about, it was full of revolutionary impulse. You know, there was kind of a revolutionary sense about it that, you know, it would uh, democratize uh, communications and that it would enable the every person to, you know, add their kind of content uh, and their messages to, to the global discussion. But instead what we're seeing uh, is the old um, top-down monopolistic uh, forms of communication taking over uh, the uh, distribution networks that you know, we thought would facilitate the every person. So, you know, Twitter is very effective, but it's it's you know, largely determined by followers. And you know, it, the way it is is that celebrities have more followers. The people who create the most outrage have more followers because people want to be entertained. 
And the, the other aspect is that uh, Twitter and Facebook and things like that end up being the great echo chamber that people uh, often post stuff to see how it's received rather than actually to make a difference. Yeah, the whole fascination with likes and uh, retweets and so forth become a metric in their own own way that then kind of self-determines what you will post next. You know, if, if there are certain kinds of content that are more popular than others, then you, over time your message becomes shaped according to, to those mm. parameters. Mm. Uh, I read a really interesting example yeah. of that just like yesterday actually, yeah. an article about a couple who were living out of their van, right, and they were trying to fund their lifestyle to some extent through sponsorships. And they had an Instagram account where they posted pictures of their van life. Mm. They called the hashtag is hashtag van life. Mm. And they started off by posting pictures of things like wild blackberries on the side of the road and sunsets and su uh, sunrise and that sort of thing, just nice landscapes and so on. But occasionally they post a picture of the woman of the couple in a bikini. And those were the ones that got the likes. And those were the ones that got the sponsorships. Yeah. And over time, the accounts just evolved. And they talked about that a little bit and how it's a little bit disappointing to them, but they've, they've got to go where the income is. And they're still only making 18000 a year, so it's only you know, just enough to live off from the sponsorships. It's not like they've become celebrities or anything, but it's just it's had to shift their entire brand and their entire experience away from something that was more authentic to wow. Something that's more cookie cutter, what, what advertisers like to see. So they had a particular mission and a particular goal that yeah. was slowly eroded over time to something that was, uh, that something that didn't align with what they wanted to do. Yeah. Mm. Sounds a bit like academia. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's a, that's a really good intro because I was thinking we should, probably, <laughs> we should probably hear a bit more from you about your particular interest here mm. because um, I think some of the things that Hart said also do touch on academia, but yeah, before, we, much, before yeah. I want to ask him about that, I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more about your ideas. So I'd like to introduce Jason Enzer properly. Dr. Jason Enzer is our research manager in the Digital Humanities mm. Research Group here. He's, um, he provides our research management, technical expertise. He develops and coordinates all sorts of projects, both internal to the university and external. He's been involved in digital humanities for over a decade. He's also proficient in many of the key technologies. So he's the one who does all of the under, under the hood work for us in our group. Um, he's been involved in a huge number of project funded projects, far too many to mention here, but um, in particular, I'd like to mention that he's the Director of Electronic Resources for the International Society for the History of Authorship, Reading and Publishing, so for SHARP. He's, been, he's a founding editorial board member for the Anthem Book History and Print Culture series in the UK, and he's a chief investigator together with Professor Simon Burrows on the Mapping Print Charting Enlightenment Australian Research Council Discovery Project. He also regularly contributes to the digital and other media, for instance, the conversation and matters relating to research impact and rethinking scholarship. And finally, he's also got a number of visiting positions in other parts of the world. He's a visiting scholar for the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands. He's a visiting researcher at Radbo University, and he's a visiting professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. And Jason has some interesting thoughts about how um, digital media in a post-truth era relate to the academy. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to unpack um, my abstract and just sort of expand on a couple of, of the key points. Um, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to kind of stand in my soapbox. Well, I'm hoping not <laughs> to be too strident, um, but a lot of what I'll be talking about will pick up on themes and issues that I've sort of been thinking about you know, for a good number of years, uh, particularly uh, you know, over the last three or four. Um, sort of picking up on Hart's point is that you know, when we're looking at digital media, we also, in digital humanities, generate a lot of digital media ourselves. And, um, and you know, part of it is to sort of counterpoint dominant or precarious narratives you know, that are uh, ill-informed Ill um, or lack an evidence-based or generous um, you know, perspective. And so I'm concerned, you know, if, if we're living in an age that we have naturalised as calling it post-truth, then what has the role of scholars been in this when you know, traditionally we are tasked with giving truth to power? That you know, we are about sort of pulling back the veil, pulling back the mask and saying, well, this is what's actually happening. What has happened with our relationship with society and community, be it in digital humanities or humanities and, and the wider uh, subject areas, that has facilitated the kinds of things that we see happening around us that are so disturbing and so are problematic. So um, in, the, in the first part of my abstract, I, I spoke about um, how the, you know, the research sector is in need of more div 
diverse ecosystem um, of valued research outputs that go beyond uh, the present rule of printed products. Uh, one of the reasons I raised that is, you know, as academics, particularly in Australia, I don't know if this is the case um, around the world, but we are ruled by what we publish in journals and, and books and chapters, at, at least until recently, uh, that, you know, your, your status as an academic was determined by how many of th these things you did, and each thing was worth a point. Anything that we did that involves digital content uh, is in Australia called a non-traditional research output. And it's one of those uh, little areas, little grey areas, that requires extra effort to um, generate the research content of it. So in, in terms of working in digital media and digital humanities, where we want to create um, forms of engagement that aren't tied to what other scholars read, we have an uphill battle. So, um, yeah, it, it, within my abstract, I then went on to say that, you know, um, the stories we academics tell ourselves uh, increasingly speak less and less to the public ideals that drew us into the academy in the first place, and more and more to a corporate image of outputs, outcomes, consultancy contracts, funding targets, measures of success, and KPIs, and that we experience this as the financialization um, of research. Now, in Australia, we're going through a, a fairly significant change um, in the academy with regards to that, and one of that's through uh, the public funding mechanism, what, what we call HERDIC, or which is the Higher uh, Education Research Data Collection Process. And that process uh, provides uh, research uh, block grant funding to eligible higher education institutions to support research uh, and research capability. Now, the new arrangements that, which came in this year um, is that they'll only use income data to um, support research institutions. Exactly right. Yeah, so whereas it used to be an entire ecosystem, now it's just like, well, if you make money, we'll, we'll give you money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, combined with the, um, the, also the relatively new Australian national and innovation agenda, uh, such, you know, such recommendations are understood to sharpen incentives for collaboration between universities and business. And this is seen to increase the commercial uh, returns from Australian researchers uh, and to openly influence research behaviour uh, by uh, assessing the so termed real world impact of research incomes. Now, setting aside the, uh, the elevation of market triumphalism <laughs> um, over civic purpose uh, and the embedded belief that uh, business interests can seamlessly occupy all horizons of research, uh, the changes ahead in, re in uh, public funding disbursement and the assessment of research quality are all about making sure universities engage in research uh, commercialization and knowledge transfer with business. Uh, and you know, the behavioral influences you know, uh, for this are through changes to funding incentives uh, you know, with a focus on more uh, effective management of intellectual property and to ensure that competitive grant criteria support, you know, primarily support opportunities for commercialization. And this changes you know, how we, how we mandate, you know, how, we, how we operate, how we function as scholars. You know, if, our, if our primary task is to bring in income, uh, then we, s we begin operating in an environment where the research questions, well, certain research questions will, will be less uh, susceptible to funding or to you know, external business income than, than other things that you know, are often uh, embedded um, you know, in, in a uh, licensed or sellable uh, product. And you know, it kind of creates an environment for us where uh, universities in the research sector end up celebrating the award of funds rather than the yes. acquittal of funds. Uh, and you know, over time, this kind of thing, I think, erodes us of our, of our public mission because suddenly when we're chasing the income rather than chasing change within the society that would be beneficial for everyone else, then the whole idea of a, of a public good uh, now becomes a private worry. Mm -hmm where you know, if we don't meet our particular financial targets per year, then suddenly our capacity to continue to operate uh, as an academic uh, comes under threat, comes under risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, you know, our um, goals and intent uh, change uh, over time. The, the, other, the other point I wanted to make um, was how, um, you know, with the changes in, in how funding is evaluated and assessed, there are also uh, observations within you know the communities around us that somehow our research is out of touch uh, with society. You know that if we're not working with business, if we're not uh, trying to 
create commercializable products, then somehow our uh, research is, uh, to quote, former politicians in Australia, wasteful uh, and ridiculous. And, uh, and obviously, you know, in, in the US, they talk about politicized research, whatever, whatever that means. Um, but you know, when, I, when that first happened in Australia, I was really shocked by it, thinking, well, you know, how, how could elected politicians you know, who fund research within Australia come about and say this kind of thing uh, about what we do? And then I realized that, well, they can say it because it's, it's what the public generally thinks and feels as well, I think. You know, that there was no public outcry against that, you know, that in, against the sense that, you know, the scholarship and, and evidence-based approaches that we generally strive for, you know, they didn't stand up and say, well, this is what we need. And if anything, there was a, a general just, you know, silent acceptance of this kind of stuff. And what it highlighted for me is that um, academia is very much out of touch with the public that it services. And, and therefore, we are unable to give truth to power because no one's actually listening to us anymore except ourselves and except our institutions. Uh, and what I argue is that, um, you know, in, in all the research we do, the public is our, our largest and silent stakeholder. And, and yet we, we don't really, uh, our institutions and, and research sector isn't set up to favor that in the ways that they would favor um, the private sector. And what I argue is that in defense of scholars, the barriers that prevent academics from adding value to where it really matters um, are not of our making, well, not quite. And that, um, you know, we, we operate in a sector where um, our national research priorities and associated goals uh, are set by the government. And these range from, you know, investigating social well-being to improving cybersecurity uh, and so forth. But how this research is disseminated and encountered uh, is at odds with public expectations of access and engagement. And so, you know, where, they, where people are able to access and engage with stuff in ways that we don't actually do it, only traditional publications count. And certainly they count the easiest, and anything that's digital requires us to um, create uh, explanatory uh, statements. And, uh, yeah, I would say that in an age where searching for tutorials on YouTube and information and Wikipedia is second nature to young inquiring minds, uh, casting digital outputs as non-traditional is out of sync with the reality of the society that we're operating in. And the division uh, of research in traditional and non-tradition uh, is at odds with community engagement. And uh, probably, yeah, my final part of the abstract was saying, well, you know, what does open mean in this context? Mm. You know, if, if we're all saying, well, let's put our printed publications, you know, into open repositories and so forth, but the public are engaging with each other in ways that are completely independent of that, then it's not really open, it's just available, but no one's accessing <laughs> it except ourselves. And you know, we, I think I was going, yeah, I was asking you, who is the actual mythical public? You know, and, and I think that's where the challenge is. Like we have this idea that when we you know, throw words like crowdsourcing and so forth into grant applications, we have an idea that the public, unless we mean other scholars, will actually engage with our materials, because we know it's really important to us, but we assume hopefully that through the great mass of people out there that it'll be important to, to everyone else as well. And this is where I, I, I think to sort of bring it back to the thing that we're talking about uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, how do, we, how do we address the issues that trouble us, you know, in the post-truth age, to, to use a term I, I will not in any way accept as being a reality, because I think we give it a name, then we we're already naturalizing you know, a, a situation. Uh, but if we take on the radical potential digital tools, if we to leverage digital infrastructures as the basic architecture of our collective responsibility, uh, then we must recognize that any viable language of open critique, provocation, and possibility begins with us being public first, and not just with our digital tools. And probably my, my last soapbox statement, if I, if I <laughs> can, I know I've been rabbiting on for a while, um, is that, and this kind of speaks to, to the area where um, I operate from, mainly because I see, you know, this, this um, tension between image and character, between how things look and how things are, uh, and that is that I would, I would go out there and say that digital humanities and similar buzzwords uh, uh, kind of uh, lack content and signal that perhaps the humanities is not enough on its own. And that's, that's one thing I kind of struggle with, that, they, that um, the, the whole idea of digital in itself um, uh, sort of does a lot of um, rhetorical lifting 
you know, like words like digital platform and digital portal, you know, the, the kind of placeholders that we see in research funding applications, uh, and that they're meant to be taken as meaning as you know meaning something, but no one really knows what. But but we all want one, <laughs> uh, and that you know perhaps we're um, entering a phase of disillusionment on the hype curve um, with digital humanities. But uh, personally, it may seem blasphemous, uh, even rancorous. Um, f to admit that I do not believe that there is such a thing as digital humanities. Um, and, but to be fair, before I'm torn down <laughs> um, at the, uh, the altar of innovation, collaboration, and all those other words that we use in selection criteria, um, I would state that I'm fairly uniform in this view. I don't believe there's um, in digital history or digital anything or digital insert your term here. I'm, you I'm don't basically believe in the digital, do you? The reason I say this is that once you closely link a field of research, um, or in the case of humanities, you know, with any one of its formats of creation or publication, uh, I, I, you run the risk of signaling uh, a loss of confidence in that underlying field uh, uh, by saying that its relevance, its meaning, its continued activity is now closely tied to its means of production and dissemination, uh, and that the meaning, medium under which research is created and distributed uh, is more important than the methods contained within the medium. Mm. Uh, and yeah, certainly, as we know, the medium is worthy um, of anal is a worthy object of analysis, and we would be, but we'd be wise to deploy a poised critical attention to its effects, as we would with any message. But this rush um, to the installation of digital as a defining character to trait um, for me remains uh, questionable. And then my last statement. <laughs> I know, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that in the vernacular of the cultural wars, I'd say that we've been drawn into the format wars of digital versus everything else. Mm. Uh, and that really we should dispense with the digital prefix altogether mm. and recognize that. And as practitioners of the humanities, you know, go back to original calling. You know, recognize that finding and defining new ways to research, perform, practice, and flex our scholarly intent um, has always been part of our craft. And that the humanities, by its very nature, is always in crisis because it is supposed to make us uncomfortable. Well, you know that <laughs> I agree with a lot of what you're saying there, but I do wonder <laughs> when, when you, <laughs> that at the end there where you bring up digital humanities, it yeah. makes me think about that article that was doing the rounds a little while ago about digital humanities being a liberal, neoliberal I sellout, it, I right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was thinking, I mean, in some ways, creating mm. research groups in digital humanities, mm. creating departments of digital humanities and hiring people into mm. digital humanities is a natural response that universities are going to mm. take to this hostility towards what they see as these ridiculous, unnecessary um, humanities that are not concerned with mm. things that business is concerned with, they're not concerned with things that the general public is concerned mm. with and therefore they're kind of this ivory tower separating mm. themselves from the world, writing research that no yeah. one's going to read. Yeah. And the universities say, well, look, these digital people at least can partner up with business, they can do mm. consulting work, they can create products that people might actually want to buy. And in a way, universities are maybe kind of hoping that digital humanities is gonna save the humanities. Digital humanities people ourselves mm. may be more skeptical of that and also concerned that in a way we're selling out our colleagues mm. because if this is the type of humanities that counts, then what about the type of humanities that everyone else is doing? Which is exactly your point, right? Yeah, it, it's um, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Sort of in acting at it, at the interface where the kinds of clients that we have uh, determine the kinds of products we can deliver, yeah. uh, it does erode the humanitarian's critical and revolutionary impulse. Uh, because naturally speaking, there are some aspects of the humanities, you know, which are often about looking at uncomfortable narratives, things that are uh, historically questionable, mm. those things very rarely get funded by business. Mm. Uh, and you, you look at all the, the great intersections um, that humanities has made, uh, you know, they talk about impact. And, you know, the, the great works that we've seen take decades mm. to make an impact. But when they do, they make a major impact. Mm. You know, I think about the work of Henry Reynolds, for example, where, you know, the, how would you be able to sustain that today within the, in the so-called commercialization you know, imperative that we all seem to have. But his work you know, took many years to filter through, to be taken up, to be questioned, to be um, you know, reviewed and responded to, it, et cetera. And you know, most environments these days are looking to explain, well, what is our impact over the next year or two yeah. or three and so forth. And you, you can't really do that in yeah. humanity. Well, I think that that was in you know while you were talking I was thinking <laughs> yeah, and um, and I know that on my soapbox <laughs> and one of my repetitive thoughts was 
to do with time, you know, with the, the mm. question of, of time and how, you know, the, in, in the context of particularly, you know, um, certain forms of contemporary media, uh, the, the sense of immediacy mm. is, it, it sort of overtakes the agenda uh, of everything for that matter. And in, in terms of academia, we know that probably the most significant work takes time. Mm. I, you're not going to produce evidence-based research mm -hmm. that's, you know, going to be meaningful unless mm -hmm. you're working at it for some time. Mm -hmm. And and that goes against the grain of mm -hmm. what expectations, the kind of contemporary expectations mm -hmm. around, you know, the headline. Mm -hmm. um, so even when you do your research mm -hmm. after over a number of years and, mm -hmm. and you have an outcome, mm -hmm. well, you have to translate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it becomes a headline. Uh, and then it's seen as, but you know, there's having also an impact. other layers around that too because that kind of research is not read by very many people to begin with. Well, and that's, that's why it has to become yeah, a headline. Yeah. But then yeah. also when you seek a publisher, then they, they are often directed by bestsellers. And so mm -hmm. finding um, publishers these days, which we need you know, for the metrics, you yeah. know, the work that we produce has to be published well, by a commercial I publisher. I wanted to address that as well. Yeah. You were, you're, you're right to um, suggest that there's been a, a devaluation of, of publishing more generally in, mm. in the academic context because of the government's um, a now kind of change of emphasis to uh, income, research income versus publication, but it buries the, the, the clear um, adage that uh, really there's no research uh, income without publication. Mm. If, you, if you want to apply for any kind of competitive mm. research money, you have to demonstrate a track record mm. in the field. That track record is demonstrated by how much you've published over the years. Print publications too. Yeah. And and NTROs are well, very both, difficult to... Well, both NTROs, yeah. I mean, NTROs yeah. is not a brand new thing. It's mm. been around. So you can make a case for NTROs as much as for conventional publications. But the point is that publication is absolutely g germane to any kind of sense as to whether you can have the capacity to carry out research or not. Mm. Well, so I the wonder. devaluation of publication in the you know, in the now in the context of our lives as yeah. academics is, you know, is a backward step. And hopefully it'll be, there'll be some kind of sense of a correction to understand the, the way in which these are closely connected, that publication is absolutely necessary for any kind of sense of whether you can conduct research in the field that you might want to now introduce or in a problem in a field that you might now want in, to introduce. So, so I'm with you on that as a devastating kind of uh, way to have to now adjust to this, this new reality. It is true, as you say, that uh, research now is, is more of a question of how much funding you can attract. Um, and so it comes to the heart of what a university is. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, our leadership in universities, not just our university, but across this country and, in, and internationally has to respond to the overall question and crisis around public funding and what it's meant to be doing uh, for you know, the public good. Well, that's, that's actually one of the, the, the key things about our sector is that um, we respond to changes within our university. Universities themselves respond to changes that happen externally mm -hmm. to them exactly. and that they all reconfigure themselves in order to be able mm -hmm. to continue to survive within mm -hmm. the research sector. But it means that mm -hmm. the academic mission is constantly being swayed this mm -hmm. way and that but by changes in government. That new, I mean yeah. that. Oh, I'm not saying you know, it's new, but I'm yeah. saying that the direction that we've gone in right now mm -hmm. is is pretty uh, anti-humanities. And to be honest, the government yeah. decisions to fund or not to fund and how to fund mm -hmm. don't come from nowhere either, and that yeah. reflects popular public opinion, right? If the public is not going to be impressed by a government that's spending a lot of money on pure humanities research, then the government's not going to spend a lot yeah. of money on pure humanities research. So it comes back to that mythical public you've talked about, who's actually wanting yeah, who, who universities to be we, doing research. How do we re-engage with them? Yeah. How do we re-engage with the public? Public, but yeah, when we see the departments word, closing you know, down. Engagement, I mean, that's been yes. in the university's vocabulary for years now. Mm. And you couldn't really pose a research project without having some form of idea of how it was going to engage. Mm. And I think you referred to that in, in your uh, presentation that... My manifesto. <laughs> yeah, your manifesto, <laughs> you know, that there had to be, you know, some form of understanding of what, you know, the research was going to work um, with and for whom it mm. was going to benefit. And that, you know, that, that's a, a standard business activity, cost-benefit analysis. Mm. And, and I think in some ways, um, I don't find that a, a problem from the point of view of 
having to now address that issue. Mm. The question is whether you can address it in a, in a way that's consistent with you know, your own sense of the values that you're bringing to your, your research interest. So you, know, you can say that your research benefits X, Y, or Z. I mean, you should be able to say that in the context of any, any particular project. If it's a particular public that you're targeting in that regard, you know, well, that would be an answer to the question of the mythical, you know, the mythical public. Again, this is not a new thing. Uh, you know, John Dewey in 1929 wrote mm. a book called The Public and Its Problems. Mm. And John Dewey is mm. often um, raised as the thinker par excellence for anyone interested in a kind of critical view of how the uh, community, if you like, for lack of a better term, is brought into a relationship to both knowledge and um, a form of engagement. So his, his sense, he had he devised a, uh, an unusual um, media work called Thought News. Now Thought News was very kind of anticipatory of social media. It was to be a kind of very um, spontaneous and um, very quickly built newspaper that would reflect everything that was sent to it by the public that you know, was asked to contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And so it was going to be like a mirror back to the mm -hmm. public. It never got off the ground. This was 1929, after Media all. Blog. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here we are in, you know, maybe uh, we, we could kind of rename social media as a form of thought news. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, yeah. these, I'm not sort of saying that's an example of a solution, but it's, it's these problems have been around for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're constantly reversioned in different vocabularies. And so we can see, you know, the problems that you raise currently in the vocabulary that you raise it. And in that way, it's, you know, it's important. I guess my experience from a, the point of view of not someone who's actually, I don't, I think, ever considered myself a humanities scholar. Um, in fact, um, perhaps a bit contrary to your position, I know I would consider myself to be a medium theorist. Right. You know, I'm more uh, over the years been involved in thinking about the, I guess, the way in which messages are constructed and delivered and received than, you know, the question of their content so much, though obviously have to be involved at that level as well. But with that emphasis, you know, we can, I can, can go back to the point where not so much humanities practices, although related ones in the social sciences, were absolutely antipathetic to anything that was not so-called traditional, you know, in, in your terms, print. Mm. And um, in my case, it was in the discipline of anthropology. And from pretty much through the 20th century into the mid-1980s, if you try to raise the value and importance of, say, ethnographic film to the anthropological project, you had a hard time finding anthropologists who not only you know, would have any kind of empathy for that view, but would have even seen a film in that field. It was just not on the radar at that point. So to fast forward to 2006, where we developed a, a special issue of Media International Australia in the field of digital ethnography, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is now very much, you know, it's a, a center of research at RMIT. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these things have their place because they work in a way to adapt to the blockages that appear. And um, in that way, I think the blockages that you refer to you know, are having to be addressed in a similar fashion. You have to find those points of contact with the communities that will allow for the work to actually, you know, go forward. What would you see as the necessary points of contact with regards to the current post-truth age in dealing with the things that we see espoused in Australian politics uh, and with Trump? I mean, how did, if, if, if there's nothing new, if you know there hasn't been an escalation uh, of the kinds of obstacles and challenges that academics face, you know, if what we're seeing now is you know part of what we've saw 20 years ago, and therefore we probably shouldn't be as perhaps as disturbed by some of the things that are happening around us, then what are the points of contact? Because I'm I'm struggling to see how how to engage. I mean, the the term engage obviously is a placeholder, much like. Yeah all the buzzwords of innovation and mm. smart and mm. digital and so forth. They do a lot of rhetorical lifting, mm. yeah, much like the word impact. Yeah. But 
when it comes down to um, how we are evaluated within our own institutions, within our own sector as an academic, none of those things actually you know, matter. Well, uh, yeah. they, they become rhetorical exercises, yeah, I think, in the end. And, yeah, yeah. and as you say, the, yeah. you know, these, these words change. Yeah, I, I think even, for even with a non-traditional research output, you know, when you're saying that they, they don't actually have equivalence with printed publications, you have to provide explanatory yeah, yeah, statements to do. explain but the research but content but to I them. Suppose, you know, yeah. I think that's a good thing in some ways. I think that gives you the opportunity to provide detail where there wasn't detail. For example... But it means you end up working twice. See, I come from mm. developing and researching. I mean, if mm. anything I develop doesn't count until I write a paper about it, which means I do do it twice. Yeah, but I think you can get around that. Um, and maybe there is a doubling. At the moment, there is a doubling for that. It was the same thing with making films. I mm. couldn't. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't. I had to make a case for yeah. a film as well. But I just I wanted to draw, draw out a, a kind of example of, of impact. Okay. Mm. So if you're sitting in front of um, normally a, a scientist who has Scopus, you know, citations, mm. then you would be in front of someone who might have, uh, God knows, depending on how long they've been working, 500, 1,000, 5,000 citations, right? And you're sitting there as a humanities scholar um, where Scopus doesn't really count very much, and you're thinking, well, how do I now argue impact? Well, you know, um, if there was, uh, in my case anyways, uh, someone who's watched my films, mm. one person, say, who's watched my films, who was able to tell me a story about what it did for them, you know, as an influence on their life. Maybe it brought them into contact with something that they then was in, were inspired in one way or another to do something mm. different with their lives. And that's one. So how many people would have seen my film? Well, who knows? But it probably would have been more than one. Mm. Um, so, so impact becomes a story. I think yeah. you're, you're in a bit of a special situation, yeah. Hart. Your, your research has much more obvious public impact than many people in the humanities would. And you're right that, that some more technical science people may not be able to show the public impact, but they can show the academic impact. But I'm thinking mm. more of, say, people who work in more dry theoretical areas of the humanities where they don't necessarily have either obvious metric. So mm. I'm a linguist, and if, if I was working on a project to do with say syntactic theory, I might come up with all, cool, all sorts of cool new mathematical techniques mm -hmm. to analyze syntax. And to be honest, that's not going to have any impact on the average person walking down the street in Parramatta. It's not going to have, it's not going to change somebody's life because they read my syntax paper. No. On the other hand, it could potentially have large amounts of impact in the future in terms of how other linguists yeah. consider their research. Mm -hmm. And I've been told quite frequently that that's not the sort of impact we care about, right? Impact mm -hmm. on other people within your field yeah. is circular. Yeah. What is your research doing for the wider world? And all you can say there is, well, the other people working in the field who have more publicly engaged projects may also yeah. be affected. No, I agree with that. So I, I just you don't know, know how yeah, how metrics work. Kind of for thing is not, yeah, I, I, you know, obviously would never defend. And <laughs> you know, I think as you as you say, there are different ways in which people can maybe work the impact agenda. I think the sense of that, um, you know, being kind of at the at the mercy of the algorithm, um, because it's often these these forms of metrification mm. are algorithmically driven and you talk about um, how does one, you know, and, and, and you as a practitioner uh, would be more aware of those kinds of things than most, Me right? Me, a non-believer. So, it's, yeah, it's almost like you're, you know, kind of arguing against yourself, as well, you said. You know, yeah. I, I don't always agree with you guys. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, we yeah. used to have a head of school who said that on occasion, which yeah. deeply was deeply disturbing. Um, but um, yeah, so so the so the the kind of force. I mean, there's even now quite a lot of interesting mm. research that goes on around algorithmic mm. determinations and, mm. in a sense, how to engage well, and, and overcome them. Well, al algorithms are sort of like a, 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 the, they're the far end of a spectrum around the black boxing of research, though. Mm. Uh, digital humanities works on that basis, too, that you, know, mm. you can present something quite, quite visually stunning, quite visually engaging, you know, has the so-called shiny and cool effect, mm. uh, but often understanding how people arrived at that, mm. you know, the decision making that, take, that took place with regards to creating the underlying data, creating the data structures and so forth, sometimes aren't always um, as open to mm. others as, as you'd like it to be, and so you, you, tend, to see, you, you tend to see a trade in surface elaborations as opposed mm. to the deep critical thinking that, that happens underneath it. Mm. Um, and, yeah, this is why, in, in some of the grant applications I've seen that they come under my eye, it, I re immediately send it back if it has you know, crowdsourcing, <laughs> mapping, mm -hmm. platform or portal because it's focusing on the shiny stuff without actually letting the research question determine the technology rather than the technology 
mm. wag the research question. question. Yeah. Mm. And again, I see that symptomatic of where institutions are moving and you, mm. and you have considerable hope that that will change, but I've kind of seen so far like a funneling where we're asked to mm. you know, focus on, and I hate the term, outputs. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and you know, sort of that Fordist productivity logic, or the logic of Fordus productivity, I should say. Yeah, and it could be the perfect storm, as you're pointing out, between a particular uh, vocabulary and a, and a set of practices that are, you know, have, have moved to, um, you know, to the right of center in terms of how it sees the, the kind of humanities work. But we, we might have harmed ourselves in other ways yeah. as well. Open access, that's a great, I know you talked about what is open. Mm -hmm. I mean, since when, you know, the idea of an open access journal is one in which you pay to be published, mm -hmm. um, I mean that didn't strike me as particularly no. a good yeah. use of yeah. of open or access as, yeah. as two words that get you know twisted up and mm -hmm. and spat out in, in a way that you know I mean uh, I think you know global media journal for want of uh, not wanting to to kind of promote you know that particular uh, project, but we never charged mm -hmm. our. <laughs> our authors for you know f to contribute mm. to uh, to the journal well, on one on one hand. I think that's a really clear mm. example of of a symptom of our current thinking about research, and that it used to be thought of that research was a public good, and therefore you would pay to get access to the research mm. as a as a reader or as an institution. But now, I mean, a lot of the time we're publishing into a void. We're publishing for it because it's a metric that we need for our jobs. Mm. So of course, mm. the good in publishing is for the researcher who publishes, mm -hmm. and so why shouldn't they be paying for the thing that yeah. pads their CV and gets them the, the new job That's or the right. promotion. Yeah, I, I think it's a kind of double negative, yeah, that um, and 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 a, a kind of appalling descent of uh, you know sort of um, I suppose some form of integrity in the development of knowledge and and its and and, and then its presentation you know to to, to the public. I, I I still don't think yeah. we're in a total situation of a to whom it may concern set of messages. Um, I think uh, if you if you you know uh, engage with a journal, the journal you would know has a, a kind of a readership, um, I hope so. <laughs> and you know you would you would not just be throwing it out. I mean, of course, uh, the internet is rife with fake journals, so uh, there's no there's no doubt that there's probably a constituency that has been publishing in fake journals and are fake, fake authors edi fake and editorial boards. with fake editorial or boards. Editorial and boards we've seen examples yeah, yeah. of those things exposed. You know fairly recently, but again, it doesn't take a lot to kind of work through the, you know, that level of fakery. I mean, I, you know, you just sort of it, it, it can, can see it. It actually can do. You'd probably be quite surprised, um, you know, that, that how um, many people get um, caught up in that. Caught up yeah. in that. Okay. yeah, because, you know, the, the drive to publications uh, means that sometimes the quality checks aren't there. I mean, our own university um, ha ha is very dedicated to ensuring that there are quality checks hmm. along the way. But it's a constant skilling up process of, of academics to ensure that what they're publishing in mm -hmm. uh, is a journal that counts. You know, because yeah. the ARC releases its list um, every couple of years of 22,000 odd journals, mm -hmm. the ones that it recognizes. Uh, but there are so many out there that aren't on that list that people publish in, not knowing whether it's in their field or out of mm -hmm. field, or whether it's actually you know, accountable publication. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I know of uh, previous examples, which I, I won't talk about, um, you know, where people have been caught up mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it, it does come down to that right. they got the invite, mm -hmm. they thought great, I'll get a publication, that'll mm -hmm. be a point, one yeah. point. Yeah. And so again, their yeah. critical faculties have been mm -hmm. slightly eroded by, mm -hmm. yeah. um, by other the, needs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the lure of um, yeah. you know, that very uh, often kind of elusive and difficult thing, which is to get published. Yeah, yeah. well, it's where as a young academic. Yeah, yeah. well, that's yeah. right. The public good of being a scholar becomes mm -hmm. a private worry of getting points. Yeah. I, yeah. I read an interesting media article about exactly that yesterday, though, and they, they were suggesting something which I completely disagree with, which was that actually there's no such thing as a predatory journal, that uh, these pay-for-access journals that don't have any peer review f fulfill a valuable niche in academia, <laughs> which wow. I thought was an interesting provocation. Their argument was mainly that they're... The, the new universities across the world, and particularly in countries where English is not the first language and where scholars maybe n don't have access to the sorts of financial resources and mentoring resources that we in Australia or people in America enjoy, these people have equal pressure to publish as we do. Mm. And to be honest, where are they going to publish? Mm. If, they can't, if you can't write in the quality of English that a journal is going to accept, even with editing, you're not likely 
to get published in any of the real journals. Um, mm. And at least some of these predatory journals will put your papers online, people will read them and cite them. And so it, even if your research is actually, if you think that your research has some value to the public mm. and you're in a situation where you can't get it published a traditional way and you need this line That's on your true. CV to keep your job, mm. why wouldn't you? Wow. Well, that was the argument that they were the making. Attraction, but that seems to me an extreme. I thought you know, it was case. extreme. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we work with our, our our authors too. If we get an interesting article, but it's not you know perfectly yeah. written, we won't necessarily reject it. We'll work with the author. We'll publish postgraduate student mm. material under a postgraduate section, so that postgrads can you know see themselves in print. But the yeah. refereeing process is different, and we announce that you know in the journal mm. that we that we provide that particular service. And it's a different kind of refereeing that mm. we provide for postgraduate publications. Even if, if they want to be refereed in the normal way, then they can do that too. But you it's know, it doesn't necessarily that mean clear. that they, yeah. you know, that they do that. So that that mm. example seems a little bit um, extreme to me. But I think the point is not totally lost when you think of, say, our PhD applications, mm -hmm. and we get you know regularly people from all over the world wanting to study at Western Sydney and. And you know those applications have to be parsed, and <laughs> they have to reach you know particular standards of you know of academic English, and also standards of you know um, solid research cases, if they're PhD theses that are being proposed, and um, and in a sense um, those things have to be checked as well. And there's mm -hmm. this wonderful agency called NUSER, which evaluates um, foreign uh, qualifications. So what is a master's degree, and you know what was what was it in terms of research, and how does one assess it against an Australian mm -hmm. master's degree? All that, all that kind of feeds into it. But then I wonder, okay, what else, you know, are we doing in making those judgments, and do we make any kind of allowance for the kind of people that you were referring to in that example, people who might have no sense of the, uh, who who don't have in any sense the equal footing, say, of an Australian applicant. Uh, mm -hmm. for a PhD coming through an Australian system and how then do we compensate for that or do we say no sorry you know those are not the people we really want in this university um, mm -hmm. so those are I think you know very difficult questions to parse if you're wanting to turn your university into s a place that people will come to not necessarily from you know the uh, the educational backgrounds that we are familiar with and know more intimately I want to end by asking you each a sort of overarching question about the topics we've been discussing. And I think Jason knows what's coming for him. I suspect they do. I want to know, how, how, would you, how would you fix it all? Oh, gosh. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. What would, you, what would your solution <laughs> be? It doesn't even have to be plausible, right? Like, what would ideally, what would you change in the current system to make it work? Right. Yeah, it's very easy to talk about the problems. Yeah. Uh, it's very, and we can get quite caught up in... Um, in, as it's clearly been evident today, contradicting ourselves as well, because there's so many tensions that pull us in different directions. And one of those aspects is that we don't have, as, as intellectuals, as academics, as scholars, we don't have control over our destinies anymore. Um, the, the, the frameworks in which we operate are constantly changing around us. And that, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be adaptable or flexible, but I do think that we should have some uh, say in, in how our work is understood and evaluated. Um, I mean, there's so many different aspects. And, you know, I, I would you know, argue for PhDs being prepped for what being an academic is actually about. Uh, I think what counts has to change. I think we need a serious discussion about what, what is accountable research. Because mm. right now it's tied to things that carried value last century because those things were tied to factory processes, you know, to get a printed paper, to get a book, to get a chapter required, getting a publisher to invest in the potential of your publication. And therefore, there's a lot of reputation around that because, you know, publishing was tied to huge processes. You know, these days, as Clay Shirky argues, there's nothing special about being published anymore. You know, when you've got print on demand and, and uh, all the other different ways of doing printing, there's yeah. actually nothing, there's no need for the kinds of uh, reputational capital we see around publishing today as we used to see um, last century. And so in my view, I think, well, we need to rethink about how we engage um, the tool kits that we have around us, which includes digital technologies, 
uh, in ways that actually are uh, more meaningful. Well, I think I see what you're, you're getting yeah. at. You're saying basically yeah. that we need to have the metrics come from the bottom up, not from the top down. Yeah, and we need yeah. to be we have to discuss what counts. Be yeah. part of that actual discussion that as opposed to being yeah. constantly told, well, you know, this is what's going to matter now, so you go ahead and do it. We're go you know, being told that we have to generate income now. Yeah, you know, it's like, well, I'm sorry, I wasn't asked about that. And, you know. So I asked Jason how we'd fix the university yeah. system, yeah. and of course I'm going to ask you how we'd fix the issues with the post-truth media. So, so we're already in that, in that kind of situation where you know, the, the forms of mediation that are surrounding us are, are, are deeply flawed. And, and that's why I was saying earlier that whereas one time you could debate the factuality or lack of factuality of news, now that debate is, we're past that point. Mm -hmm. Now we have to be vigilant about everything that emerges in the public sphere that calls itself mm -hmm. news and, and be so vigilant, so critical that we can't debate it or debate the institution. We have to actually go to the fact or the lack of fact and research it and find out whether indeed it's true or not. So that's a change in the way we think about our, our media services. And I think, interestingly, I think the institution of journalism is recognizing this in itself, and it's a good thing. And those who comment on um, the integrity of journalism actually, I think, are going to the view that what becomes more important now is not journalism as such, it's the journalist. It's the person, mm -hmm. it's the individual, the guy or woman who is reporting on these things and the kind of integrity or lack of that they can themselves project as people um, offering up truth in a post-truth world. So, you know, that move maybe is what brings us back to mm -hmm. our humans versus robots kind of, you know, <laughs> metaphor. So I think the a whole, I mean, there is, you know, this kind of interesting notion about the Anthropocene and the, the idea of, you know, all these things that um, we took for granted about what humans were, you mm -hmm. know, now have to be changed to take account of the fact that that, that barrier between human and robot is that maybe is more porous it has been, than, yeah. than it, you know, ever was. And if that's the case, then, mm -hmm. well, we just have to be vigilant about it understanding that mm. the fact is those boundaries are blurred. Yeah, we have and, um, mixed realities. And, yeah, and we can mm. think of the world now as, in that way, completely consisting of all these blurred boundaries. I think yeah. that's a really great note to finish yeah. on. So thank you both, Jason and Hart. And that was the Digital Humanities Research Group at Western Sydney University.